the epistle appointed to be read for this, the tenth Sunday after Pentecost, is taken from the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, you know that when you were Gentiles, you went to dumb idols according as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God says anathema to Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts with the same Spirit, and there are varieties of ministries with the same Lord, and there are varieties of workings with the same God who works all things in all. Now the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone for profit. To one through the Spirit is given the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to the another faith in the same Spirit, to another the gift of healing in the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But all these things are the work of one and the same Spirit who allots to everyone according as he will. And the Holy Gospel. is taken from St. Luke, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. At that time, Jesus spoke this parable also to some who trusted in themselves as being just and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and began to pray thus within himself, O God, I thank thee that I am not like the rest of men, robbers, dishonest, adulterers, or even like this publican. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I possess. But the publican, standing afar off, would not so much as lift up his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his breast, saying, O God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went back to his, to his home justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. Thus for this Sunday's Holy Gospel. My beloved people, I merely draw your attention to the one point in today's uh, bulletin about next Sunday uh, that we will have the blessing of automobiles or vehicles or whatever and uh, modes of transportation and uh, those of course we have never done this never, we've never really done this before and uh, we would like to start this practice and I suggest that in the blessing of this that each one uh, somehow uh, stand by his, his or her own uh, vehicle of transportation. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. My beloved people, we have to pray. As I look at our little church this morning, as has been for the last few weeks, I see that a little bit here, and one there, and the one the other place, and our attendance is beginning to fail somewhat. I know that in, I know the cases in, uh, in some instances 
uh, where it is necessary for certain ones to be absent. But uh, nevertheless, though, we can feel there is a going down somewhat in attendance. Uh, we here, some time ago, used to have quite a full church. So we need to pray and pray that this tendency does not continue, but rather that our own people uh, will come and observe the, uh, the obligations that we as Catholic Christians, Christian Catholics, or whatever, must observe. Today is the gospel concerning the poor Pharisee and the poor publican. In former times, we have, I have myself, spoken rather at length concerning the Pharisee. I would be repeating myself probably if I continued to do so because there's only so much bad you can say about somebody and then you have you start inventing things to say. Strangely enough, this morning I am not going to speak ill about the Pharisee. I think that due to the circumstances that are prevailing everywhere today, I think I might say some things in defense of the poor Pharisee. You all, whoever you are, and wherever you live, and whatever you do, on a daily basis, come more face to face, elbow to elbow, with the degraded conditions of our world today. You see it much more clearly than we do here in the monastery. We are quite sheltered. And I speak for myself because since they have more or less sequestered me gently and have kept me a little bit uh, locked up where I don't get a chance to go to town like I used to go to town almost every day, now I go to town maybe once every two or three months. So fortunately or unfortunately, they keep, they, keep, they keep me somewhat behind locked doors. Occasionally, I do have to go out. And when I do, I tell myself, Thank God they love me enough to keep me behind locked doors. Take me home as fast as you can. We can say what we want to about the Pharisee. And what he did was wrong. And we know it. But there's one thing about the Pharisee that we simply have to acknowledge, that even in the wrongness of what he did, he still had enough about him to acknowledge the presence of a supreme being to whom he could speak. He had enough of whatever it was that indicated to him there was a being superior to himself. There was a being 
that stood for goodness and truth and elegance and nobility and obedience and humility and 10,000 other good things. He knew that and he addressed himself to that being. Proudfully perhaps, but nevertheless, he acknowledged his very presence acknowledged the existence of somebody or someone superior to himself. Today, or right before I start that, and that he also comprehended that it was important that he should go to that individual superior to himself and acknowledge to him certain things. That he was aware of this and he felt the necessity to do so. Today, everything Everything in the vocabulary of mankind, every man, object, thing, principle, ability, knowledge, information, everything, everything has become so shop-worn, so cheap, so street dirty, so common, so ordinary, so unimportant, so unnecessary, so take it or leave it, everything, you name anything that might come to your mind, Name it and look at it. Religion itself. Religion itself has become, I hate to use this term, but I can hardly find anything that is, more, that is better descriptive. A religion itself has become street dirty. Forgive me for saying that, but I can think of no better way to put it. Everything that I, in our holy religion that once upon a time stood out for something uplifting, anything that was edifying, anything that picked us up and carried us from moment to moment, anything that made us feel clean, that made us feel wholesome, that made us have just a good feeling, everything, everything has been made dirty. Every image that you can think of has been cheapened, has been distorted, has been made, as I said a moment ago, street dirty. Even our crucifix is street dirty today. Everything. You have been, I'm sure, looking, witnessing the events of the past few days that have prevailed in uh, Australia. We haven't, I haven't, but I have heard. Is that religious? Is that proper? Does that 
uplift me? Does that draw me closer to the Supreme Being? Placards, women, men, whatever, involved in situations that are totally out of place, are completely in bad taste, just awful. We, the older ones of us, still remember enough, the oldest of ones are better yet than those of middle age, but the oldest of us can remember well enough the magnificence of that which was magnificent, the beauty of that which was beautiful, the tastefulness of that which was tasteful. We can remember that. And we make comparisons, and we can't help but look back and look now and make comparisons and see the complete, absolute, undescribable or indescribable difference that exists between that and this. Our little children, our poor, poor, poor little children. They have nothing to compare this of today with. And so they have come in, in, unavoidably. They have come to feel, to think, to understand, to comprehend that what we see today as we step outside the front door, what we see today, they cannot but know or think or feel that this is proper, that this is the way it is. You remember here some weeks ago, I mentioned the example of when I went to school elsewhere. The school was located in the city where there was a huge flour mill. And the smell of the flour mill was really bad, truly bad. And when I arrived there, it was sickening, actually. Very, very nauseating, to be sure. But after a while of breathing that air all the time and only that air, I became accustomed to it. And when I went home to where there was clean air, believe it or not, the clean air smelled bad. Our little children have been born in a situation where they, their first, the first breath that they took in life was of foul air. That's all our little children know. They do not know what it is to be holy. They do not know how it feels to be good. They do not know how to address themselves to anybody. Good manners, good taste, obedience, everything has gone with the wind. And here we are, blessed people. Here we are. And because we are trying our best to live a noble life, and nobility, 
Nobility. Nobility. When nobility goes out into a dirty street, how is nobility received? Do you go out into the dirty street with noble clothing today? What is noble clothing today? It doesn't exist. And the uglier, the most unkempt, the sloppiest, the meanest, the dirtiest look that one can put on himself today is the most proper look today. And when we, trying to be noble, trying to act noble, trying to act proper, go out into that mess, we stand out like sore thumbs and people laugh at us. And they say, what's wrong with him or her? I'm not at all trying to bring back that which was once upon a time, we used to see a movie called The Little House on the Prairie. We all looked at that, it's a nice little movie. I'm not suggesting that we should go back to that. But I am suggesting decency. And that our world has about it that which is destructive of anything that is decent. Excuse me for bringing up an example. There are times when we ourselves, here in the monastery, myself even, often before, but now not so often, when we have garbage, a large amount of garbage, to be toted away. So, we have to travel to the local landfill we used to call it a city dump. My beloved people, the smell of that place, the look of that place, I can't talk about. Where well, you have to pick and choose where you plant your feet as you look for a place to deposit your wares. Is not our world that way? This is gloomy. Yes, it is. But we have lost, all of us have lost that which once upon a time prevailed and was our everyday way of living. I remember when little old ladies, even in the country, would have to go to the mailbox from their front doors and the porches. Those precious little ladies would first of all clean up, take a bath, put on their brand new starched little gingham dresses and then go out to the mailbox. Do you see that anymore? It's not there. But we have taken that which is ugly and put it as the proper way of life. Our religion, we have forgotten in general what our religion stands for. We were placed here not for anything, any consideration at all, 
whether what it is a, a, a purpose is, and that purpose is to give worship. Our purpose is to acknowledge. Our purpose is to look to a supreme being who put us here, and that we are obliged, whether we like it or not, to give service to that being. It is not up to me, it is not up to you or anybody that whether I want to be here today or not, or I don't feel like it, I think I'll stay home and stay in bed, or I'd rather, there's a television program that I don't want to miss, therefore uh, I, I think I'll stay home today and look at the television program. You, you can go to Mass. I'll stay here. Let me tell you something. In my day, that never came up as a discussion. My dear father and my dear mother got up out of bed and they started preparing to go to church. That automatically was a signal that everybody paid attention to. Nobody had enough courage to stay in bed. Nobody. It just was simply, you did it. That was that. And we all filed off together and got into the one car that practically all families had, only one car once upon a time, and we drove off to church. And everybody was in church, big, small, babies, grandmas, grandpas, fat people, thin people, young people, and all other kinds of people. Everybody was in church. And everybody exercised that which is proper to be found inside of a church. My beloved people, don't think for a second that I'm fussing at you. You know I'm not. I'm distraught and worried and concerned. And I can see that the water that is poured into a sieve is gradually, gradually, gradually going through the sieve. That there might be no water left in it in the future. Hold on to your religion. Hold on to your real purpose in coming to church. Hold on to your acknowledgement of a supreme being who expects certain things from us. And let us not develop the attitude that is today, well, you can take it or leave it. Or I can go to this church, I go to that church. We're all giving worship to God. We're all singing praises to God. So what's wrong with that? No, there's nothing wrong with giving to praise to God. We know that. So my dear people, let us put first things first. And let us pray for courage. Let us pray for conviction. Let us pray for the ability to pass on courage, conviction, dedication, a good life to our children. I realize, as I said a moment ago, I realize that our children, our little babies are born. The first breath of air is of dirty air. Somehow, I don't know how, but somehow, at least make it to where your children can visualize can imagine at least that there is something better even here on this earth. We are definitely in desperate times. The times, as I said before, are worse today than they were before the flood. At the 
before the flood, they laughed at the builders of the ark for being stupid to listen to whoever and whatever. Today, we care so little that if they were building an ark, we would walk right by them and pay no attention to them. We would not even know to laugh at them, would we? We are so completely self-centered now that anything outside of me is not important. And whether I look or feel or think or smell bad or look bad or think bad, if it pleases me, then it is all right. That's all that matters, that it pleases me. So, may God bless you. And as we look at this poor Pharisee today, at least the man knew that there was somebody bigger than himself. And the poor other man who was in the back of the church, that he knew, he knew for certain there was somebody in the back of the church, and that he realized completely his inadequacy, and that he wanted to do something about it in order to do what was right. We too must work that way, and we must enter into a religious life, a life that is more completely committed to Almighty God more completely committed to that which is right and just. Let us not give in to discouragement, however. We must not be discouraged. And when we see things going down, 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 let us still keep in mind that Almighty God is still there. Let us keep in mind that in spite, in spite of all of the difficulties in spite of all the dis that presents itself that is discouraging, in spite of anything that is not right, in spite of all the lightning and the thundering that comes pounding around my head, there's a reason for it. Because God, as far as I'm personally concerned, and each of you personally is concerned, God has to see, God has to know the substance that I am, the stuff that I am made out of. He has to see for himself the strength of what I say is right, of what I intend to do, that it is strong. That when I say I love him, that he will know that I truly love him. And when he does come back to gather up the fragments, that I will at least, hopefully, my dear people, and you, hopefully, precious people, will be among those fragments. And when he says, where are you? That you will say, here I am, Lord. I do believe. Be men and women of faith, every one of you, every one of us, strong faith. Do not give up. Your God will not be outdone in generosity for whatever you give to him. Beloved people,